Okay, all right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Unlocked. And today's guest is Benjamin Drury, the culture guy. Benjamin is responsible for England fans singing Swing Low at rugby matches. He's been on Dragon's Den with his invention, Lace Em Ups. He's toured writing, directing and performing with theatre companies. And he's worked with some of the biggest companies on the planet. Benjamin makes workplaces awesome. And he also works with extraordinary forward-thinking leaders to help build authentic, purpose-led, people-centred organisations fit for the 22nd century. Welcome to the show, Benjamin Drury. Ricky, thank you. Thanks for that marvellous uh, intro as well. It's almost as if I wrote it myself. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, mate. It's a pleasure to see you. How are you? Are you keeping well? I'm doing all right, thank you. It's summer. We've got long days. We've got beers in the garden. What's not to love, my friend? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, it is a pleasure to have you here because I've been talking about this probably since like season two. Your name keeps popping up on various different podcasts, the Free Men in Podcast. We talk about you. We all love you, me, Alan and Matt. And um, finally, I've got you on for the first episode of season three. And the reason being is that I'm on a journey at the minute, Benjamin. Yeah, I'm on a bit of a journey to inspire and empower people to be the best version of themselves and unlock that little magic within us to be the best version, but also to create magical customer experiences. And of course, we need great culture if we're going to create a magical customer experience. So before we deep dive into culture, tell us who you are and what do you do? Well, as you mentioned, I'm otherwise known as the culture guy. And I work with organizations on building workplaces where people can thrive. So I tend to, I tend to work with kind of leaders who are looking to, to use business for good. They're looking to build something a little bit different. They're not looking to just do business as usual, you know, transactional exchange of products. They're actually looking to solve a problem, make the world a little bit better. They've got compassion, they've got generosity, and they want to do something different. And that's where I step in and help them articulate that, understand what it is, and then implement it in their business, in their systems, in their language, in the way they interact, in who they hire, and all that kind of thing. And that's how we build cultures and organizations. Love that. And I'm a massive fan of this because as we've previously spoken before, a lot of my work previously to all this was that I would go into teams as well and create that great culture to create a high-performing team in their new environment and to deal with change. So I love this word, culture. But for anybody listening that's probably not heard of this word or they don't really know what it means in their own business or in their team, what is culture? I, there's a lot of, you can go out there and there's a lot of definitions and there's a lot of complexity and there's a lot of people out there trying to obfuscate it. But simply put, it's from the Latin word to grow. Mm. It just, it's a place where something grows. A, what grows depends on the type of culture you create, but a culture is just a place where something grows. And when we talk about it in terms of business, it's, it's the behaviors and the atmosphere and the values and the ways of doing things and how we interact. And it all kind of encompasses into an environment in which either people grow or maybe people don't grow, either flowers grow or weeds grow, depend, you know. but it is yeah. just that environment and atmosphere in which something grows. Yeah, absolutely. And this is the thing, I think, especially now where we're now in this point in time where now we're kind of coming out of this last 12 months of darkness being in this lockdown. And now we're starting to kind of go back into normality. Teams are going back into the offices. Businesses are starting to booming again. I think that it's really important to have this conversation. And one of the things that I wanted to discuss with you is this idea of how do we create a customer-focused culture? So I'm on this journey, as you know, to try and understand how do some people, some teams and some businesses create these magical experiences when some others don't? And I think there is a massive direct link here too culture and how does it feel what does it look like to be in that business uh, whether you're a, on a single business you know solopreneur small business owner or even in large teams it's all about how it feels to be in this team and what is it like so I'd love to talk about this so in terms of the culture it's on about growing I know that you have a fantastic analogy that I'm going to nick from another podcast which is this idea of a stick of rock from a good old Whitley Bay. And uh, I love this idea. It was a fantastic definition. If you could, if you're happy to share it, this, your metaphor or your example of what that stick of rock means in terms of culture. Yeah, absolutely. I always talk about this. And sometimes I'm talking to US audiences and they just look at me blankly because they have no idea what a stick of rock is. <laughs> um, but in the UK, uh, when you go to a seaside town, you can buy what we call a stick of rock, which is just like a, a stick of hard candy, essentially. But all the way through the rock, they manufacture it. So it has the 
the name of the town kind of written all the way through it. So if you snap it in the middle, you can still read the name of the town. Yeah. And to me, the idea of culture is actually understanding what you stand for and your values and making sure they are written through your organization like a sticker up. Every touch point, every interaction reinforces and exposes those values so that no matter where, how people interact with you or how they connect with you or who they talk to, it always feels the same because your values are written through the organization like a British seaside stick of rock. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. It absolutely makes sense. And uh, I'm going to go into a couple of examples later on about where this has absolutely changed for me, where you cut open that stick of rock and you just can't, you can't live it, you can't breathe it. It just doesn't make sense. And therefore, the uh, behavior and my performance dropped. So if we were to go right down into the basics about this discussion about culture. So, all right, I'm a small business owner. We've got loads of different people listening to this podcast, which are big businesses, people in the L&D space, directors, small business owners. Where do we start with culture? You've got this idea of growing, um, but where would we start in forming a great culture? The starting point is knowing what you are trying to build. Uh, you know, none of this is rocket science, although there are a lot of people out there that try and get you to spend a lot of money and make it seem like rocket science, but it's <laughs> not, trust me. Um, but you've got to understand, you know, what is it we stand for? What are the rules of the game that we're playing to? And once you understand that, it then becomes easier to start to implement them. But often, um, people, it, it happens organically. You know, you start a business and you are the business and it kind of grows and you hire some people that you like and you think can do the job and you get to 20, 30, 50 people and you've never sat down and articulated what are the core values of this organization because it's just grown organically. Yeah. You're just assuming that everybody understands them and knows them. And yeah. then you wonder why, well, over here in this area of the business, it's not quite as it should be. Why not? Yeah. Because you haven't articulated, this is what we stand for. These are the rules of the game. And I'll give you a quick analogy. Yeah. It's like, I mean, I coach, I coach rugby. And when, when we play rugby, there is an edge of the pitch. We know where we're supposed to play the game. And when it goes out, we stop the game and we bring it back in. And that's the same. You know, what are the lines we are not going to cross in doing business? What is our playing field? Have you defined that? And that's what we do when we define our values. We say, look, this is where we're going to play the game. And often we try and do it outside of the standard business. You know, this is where everybody who's an estate agent plays the game. We're going to play it over here. Because we're yeah. going to stand out and we're going to have set set of values that are different. And that's what you're trying to do. But often people haven't done that because everything has grown organically. And the bottom line is every organization has a culture. Yeah. If you do not define it, it will happen organically. And it likely as not will end up somewhere you don't want it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and so it is a great thing here. So thinking back to what I used to train with my old team. We go into teams and try to understand what their values, what's important to them and what's going to drive that behavior. And we used to talk about this idea of, I think it was based on loosely on Jim Rohn about how can you celebrate success if you don't know where you're going? It's about having that mission and that drive and that purpose. And where are we actually going today? You know, why do you come up, you know, why do you turn up to work every day? Why do you do it? And I know like back in, I, I, I love Mondays, Ben. I absolutely love Mondays. I love it because, yeah, love it. I, I absolutely, I hate this idea when I see people going, oh, it's work tomorrow. Well, don't go to work then, go somewhere else. Work somewhere where you, you know, feel valued. You're adding value to the world. And I love it. I love it because I can wake up and I can go create magic, whether that's with, you know, podcasting or with people. I love that idea. But like you, I think that people just kind of, like you said, they just kind of get blinkers on, fixed minded, and they just kind of, carry on and coast and then they forget about why did they even start in the first place yep. so a great example for me was i remember when i um so i joined a team we were national trainers throughout the whole country it's fantastic and eventually as the kind of company started to kind of mix and merge we got picked and dropped and went into another team and i remember the first day i'm still good friends with my pal uh daryl uh, who was our new manager and the first day i remember he walked in and he said to us all he said uh, you're paid far too much to do this job. I don't understand what you really do, really. Oh, all right, okay, cool. Right, okay, so that's setting the tone, right? Okay, so this yeah. is the new team that we're going to go into. And then as we soon found out, as you can quite imagine, the values of what we were all about, about having autonomy, belonging, and competence stripped away, you can probably imagine, guess what happened? Behavior. A lot of, a lot of people left as well, I no doubt. 
Yep. Uh, the behavior went down. I remember one time I was driving all the way up to Manchester doing something that is not part of my job or what's important to me. And I had to do it. And I just drove back home thinking, what the fuck am I doing this? This isn't me. This is what I signed up for. This isn't Ricky. And um, yeah, that massively drove that behavior. So if we were to talk about this values thing, how do people understand what's important to them to create their culture? It's, it's really good. And you know, don't get me wrong. They were creating a culture. And it may have been that the culture they were creating was all about efficiency and not about people. And they were doing it consciously and they knew what they were doing. And that's, that's the approach they were doing. Yeah. Good on them. Knock yourself out. You're going to lose a lot of staff. But if that's what you're doing and you're doing it consciously, fair, fair, fair game to you. Yeah. Um, but I think the bottom line is imagine the opposite was true. Imagine every single person who worked for you got out of bed loving Mondays. They got out excited to go to work. They got, up, they got out of bed early because they were so desperate to get to work and do the job because they loved it. Yeah. Imagine that would happen. Yeah. Or imagine that the is, world that would yeah, be exactly. in. Yeah. That is absolutely yeah. possible if you can give your people something worth getting out of bed for. Yeah. And so you've got to start with that, with that premise. What is it we're doing here? What yeah. is the good we are putting into the world because we exist as an organization? Yeah what is it and how can I articulate that in a way that that allows my people to get excited I'll give you a quick example there's a lot of um, people in the transport industry at the moment really struggling because they can't get the staff a lot of their drivers last year were Europeans they all went over Christmas of course yeah Boris wouldn't let them back in yeah I'm not sure I'm not sure that's actually the political case I'm <laughs> yes, but yeah. you get my point you know yeah Brexit came and went and they they didn't come back yeah for whatever reason and they're talking about, you know, we need drivers. Can you come and drive for us? We're going to throw money at the problem. Can you come and drive for us? What happens if they completely framed it in a different way and said, actually, guys, we are the backbone of Britain. Us driving and getting stuff where it needs to be. We are the, we are the, the central nervous system. Without us, this country doesn't run. Come and help me yeah. get this country running like clockwork. Yeah. Would they get more drivers? Would people actually want to do that job? Of course they would because you yeah, framed yeah. it differently you've understood it differently it's not just about driving yeah. it's about supporting every other person in the country and then when you turn up and you deliver you go i'm coming here to support you how can i help here's your stuff yeah. service level goes up as well yeah because you understand what you're doing for the person you're delivering to yeah the whole yeah. atmosphere changes and it's all yeah. about framing and understanding what is it people are getting out of bed for Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's too many times we see this where businesses just don't do it and they just carry on as normal. And then you get to the point, this happened to me. I went to a store um, where there was a couple of individuals, behaviors that were just not part of that culture. And I remember first saying, hey, uh, you know, why, why do you do that? And asking that question. And this is just how we've always done it. This is how we always do it. Oh, did you know that it's actually the wrong way of doing it? No, no one's ever told me that. I've always done this for 10 years, you know. And it's just because we're, we're losing track of where we're going. What, what's going on here? But I love this idea because this is linked to something that we talked about on the Yellow Magic Hour about recruitment. Yeah. And we talked about this idea of, you know, where we recruit for capability and skills. But when do we actually stop and say, what do you believe in? Yeah. Hey, I'm going to interview Ben for my team. What do you believe in? Now, surely if that other person started to respond in a way of like, yeah, I believe in, in autonomy, belonging, competence, making a difference in this world, we'd hire you on the spot because all the skill comes later on. But yeah. we just don't see that. And I'm sure you probably see that in a lot of the businesses that you visit as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's something about um, you can hire for skill and they will do the job. But they will also contribute to your culture. Yes. And if they don't share your values, that contribution is going to be negative. Yeah. And that is going to have an impact. So when I, when I talk about hiring, I always talk about hire for cultural contribution. So not necessarily culture fit, but hire someone that's going to bring more life to your culture. They share your values. They love what you're doing, but they've got a slightly different take on it. So they're going to do it in a different way. They're going to bring more color and more life. And over time, what you find is your culture develops and blossoms into something that is it, it's impossible to copy everybody looks at you and goes how are you doing this You're like, i don't know we're just hiring the good people <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely so, so would you say there's something here about um going against the grain doing things differently rather than just following the crowd i doing things your way which may be following the crowd you know actually yeah. this you know, we are a massively safe pair of hands you can guarantee that we will get it done we're reliable because we've yeah. got every, you know, we're ISO 27,000, whatever it is, we are nailed on. 
we're following the crowd. We're we are the most reliable in the you know, that's fine because that might be your culture. So it's not necessarily about going against the grain, but I would suggest that often um, business owners want to step out of their comfort zone. They want to, and they, they, they've got something in their heart to stand out and build a culture that is different, but they're a bit too nervous of it because that's not the way business has been done. They, they don't have the confidence to do it or they're yeah. so used to writing proposals for funding and for banks that they all go, they strip out the emotion and go all professional on us. And that's where guys like, you know, that's, that's where the work that I do comes in. And actually I can help them and give them confidence and stand alongside them and say, don't panic, this is going to work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but this is maybe thinking about something recently that I've been having in terms of my own thinking. So over the last couple of months, you know, I've been able to have that flexibility and that free time where I've not been actually able to go out and perform or present or run workshops, whatever. And I've been part of quite a few different kind of cultures, I would say. So different memberships, different sites, uh, the PSA with yourself and all different people. But recently I got lost. I had this moment where I just was being absorbed into too many different things and I was hearing different things and I was starting to lose the essence of me. So I was hearing so much feedback and so many different things, or you should do this or you should do that. And I just started to think, hang on a minute, whoa, 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 hang on. This is not me. I'm being someone else. And this isn't uh, fitting with my core values of what's important to me, my vision of where I'm going. And I actually just stopped and I just canceled loads of meetings and said, no, that, that's not, that's not going to help me get to where I want to be. And I realized like, bloody hell, like I'm not being me. And then therefore, if I think if I would have carried on, I think whatever business avenue I would have gone down in the future, it would have completely gone off topic to where I originally started. Yeah, absolutely. You and know? sometimes business owners will, you know, sleepwalk down those paths because they've been told yeah. and they've got coaches and this is the way it's done. And actually, it's a scary place to be. And this yeah. is why, you know, you get burnout at 50 because they're just so, you know, they're on a, a, you know a, a trudging on a wheel and it's just like and actually they've lost that essence of well hold on a minute no i did i started this for a flipping good reason with yeah. a passion and a heart to make a difference and i've you know i've taken all this advice and i've borrowed systems from here there and everywhere because this is the way business is done and it's, we've got lost where have we gone yeah yeah absolutely and I, i'm guessing as well uh, we i'm seeing quite a few people that are quite lost at the minute you know we've had all this 12 months off and we're now feeling a little bit different. We're doing things differently. People are working from home. And I'm guessing now that we're now going back into the world. So how do we then kind of get back on the boat? You know, that boat of where we were going. How do we do that? How do we kind of get back onto what was the most important thing to us? Absolutely. I mean, the first question is, do you want to, do you want to get back on the boat? Let's make sure we're getting on the right boat here. Because we've had yeah. a good, good year and a half of introspection. Let's actually make that count. Yeah. And some people will absolutely definitely want to get back on that same boat. Yeah. Some people will be like, actually, what? No, I wasn't really enjoying this trip anyway. Let's find something <laughs> else to do. And that's all okay. Yeah. That is so good. And I think one of the things that we've got to look at now in terms of culture is that the world has moved. We can now work at home. And all the research suggests actually people have been more productive, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, but what we've got to do is we have to move away from this command and control structure. And I'll come back to the analogy of the, of the rugby team. You know, actually, I train, I train uh, the rugby team. I, I, give, I teach them the skills. We practice. We practice maneuvers. We teach them the kind of tactics of the game. We, we, we give them a game plan. We send them out onto the pitch. And then there's absolutely naff all I can do. Yeah. They have to make their own decisions. In the moment, they have to decide what to do. They know where the playing field is. They know they need to go forward. They know the objective is to score and they understand how we want to play the game and how we're trying to do it. But they've got to go and un within that framework, they've got to go and make their own decisions. They've got to do their own thing. And we have to start thinking about that for business. That actually, yeah, put in the framework, let them know the values and let them know where the playing field is, but cut them loose to go and play. Yeah, yeah. And a part of that is what you will find is, and I find this is I could control every aspect of that game and say right in this situation i want you to do this this and this and in this situation you need to do this this and this and for rugby you know th there's probably 20 or so situations you might find yourself in and i could probably pres prescribe most of them but that would limit the talent of my players mm -hmm. whereas actually there are things that they do in situations that i look at and go my word that is exceptional i wouldn't have even thought of that 
That is yeah. genius rugby playing. And without that freedom to make those decisions, I'm never going to see any of that. Yeah. That is part of the beauty of creating that field where, you know, let them play. Let them yeah. make their own decisions. Let them make their own mistakes as well. But actually, you will find what comes out is far superior to anything I could prescribe or define or put in a script. Yeah. So there's is so is there a set of values that you have then in that rugby team? Like, have you created a culture within that team? Yes. Yes. There's a number yeah. of values we have. We work to kind of five areas. One is physical, um, the physical side of things. One is the mental side of things. Um, one is um, the team side of things. And then there's two areas in the game of of, of skills and ta- of positional skills and tactics and things like that. And in each of those areas. Now, we'll, it all comes down to actually our job as a team and our job as coaches and our job as a team is to support everybody else to be brilliant. And if we do that, the rest of the team will support us to be brilliant. Yeah. And that is the whole game. We're playing for each other here. And when somebody's doing something, my job is to make you brilliant. Yeah. And that's, that. how, the, that's how the team operates. And that means yeah. that everybody is pushing everybody forward. We're cheering each other on. We're helping each other when we don't get stuff. You know, our, the people that are great kickers are helping the people that are not so good kickers, you know, the, because they're supporting each other. And that yeah. is one of the core values. There's lots of other core values about respect and things like that. But it's all about in each of those areas, how are you helping your teammate? I love that, which, which comes down to behavior, doesn't it? I, yeah. I think about the example I've seen just recently, you know, Sky Brown. Fantastic, Scott Brown, 13-year-old Olympic skateboarder. I'm a big fan of skateboarding, midlife I'm, crisis, everyone. I'm nearly but... 50. I haven't got anywhere close to what she's become <laughs> 15, 13 years. I'm, I know, I'm it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't even doing that at 13. But what I watched, which was amazing, and both the men as well, was you've got people from all over the world, not necessarily in the same team, but they have created their own culture because every single one of them at the end, they all went up to each other and like hugged them, patted them on the back. Yeah, they're probably friends from other competitions, but this culture was just fantastic, which has inspired me to, you know, go do some new moves tonight when I go to the skate park. But I just love that idea. And there was a great example when Sky Brown got the bronze. There should have been, I think it was a, a Japanese rider. She should have got the, the gold, I think, but she fell off and she was in tears straight away. And everybody just picked her up. All the girls who'd all contested picked her up and put them on the shoulder. And I just thought this is amazing. Um, but the reason I wanted to talk about this was because I know that we've discussed this before. Um, as I've said before in my own team, that as soon as those values changed, um, it, it didn't fit with my core values and what I was important to me, my behavior started to change. And um, I know we discussed, I think, this a bit before about the Barcelona way by Damien Hughes. Uh, yeah. Cheeky Bagheerstein, he used to have this fantastic phrase with Man City, which is, Talent will get you as far as the dressing room door, but your behavior determines how long we keep you here. Yeah. And there's that whole thing, isn't there, that it's, it's important that you've got a set of values that's going to drive that behavior. But what can we talk about in this idea of how do we encourage great behaviors in teams? Um, it's simple, really. The behaviors you reward and the behaviors you sanction are what you're going to get, quite simply. It, it, it doesn't come any more any any more difficult than that. And yes, you know there are nuances around that. You know, I see I see Brian behaving like some way, and he's getting advanced. Okay, I'm going to start if I want to get want to get on. I'm going to start behaving like that. Yeah. You know, I, I, the, all the high performers turn up late to meetings because they can get away with it. So if I want to be seen as a high performer, I'm going to turn up late to meetings. Yeah, yeah. What gets sanctioned? What gets rewarded? It does come down to that. And. It's more than just financial reward. You know, it's inclusion, it's belonging. Do I, if I, if I behave like this, do I get the best jobs? Do I get the more interesting jobs? If I behave like this, do I get the ear of the, the boss? All those kind of things. There's group dynamics in there. But ultimately, what, what are the behaviors that I'm rewarding? What are the behaviors that get me where I want to go? And if that, yeah. if that is, you know, if those are behaviors that don't fit the sort of culture you want, then you're in trouble. You've got to go back and say, well, let's start rewarding the behaviors we do want. And yeah. in, in that process, people are going to get arsy and some people are going to leave. Welcome to the world. That's, that's a good yeah. thing. Yeah, that's it. And that's what's going to then kind of, you know, balance out, isn't it? And make yeah. it a better culture. Yeah, it happened to me when I was a manager. I started to kind of pick up the slack for people, uh, come into a store and I remember starting to build this culture of what was important to us. And I remember, I think the first day I asked everybody to on a flip chart to put, what do we want to be famous for? You know, what's important to us? Because before that, they were just coasting, coming in, 
every day, serving customers and going home. Yeah. And there was none of that um, feeling of belonging. It was just a job, a process. Yeah. I, I can't stand process. It's all about the feeling for me and this experience. And um, what happened? We started to encourage that. We started to reward and uh, nurtured it. And what happened? Performance improved, you know? Yeah. Um, it's amazing. Um, so yeah. Oh, sorry. I go talking, on. I know. I was just talking to um, talking to somebody this week. I'm about to start some work with a with a city, a, a UK city, city council. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping uh, it's just kind of speculative work at the moment that we're doing to investigate what he's doing. But I'm hoping it'll lead to some work. But we'd had this similar conversation that you know they're doing a good job, but everybody's just doing the best. You know, it's mediocrity. It's you know maybe a little bit above mediocrity. It's a good job. It's fine. It's acceptable. And we, what we need to talk about is how do we become the best city in Europe? How do we become the envy of every other city in Europe? That's what we're aiming for. That's what we're going to be famous. We want to build a city where people want to come and live here because it's awesome, where they're talking about us in countries 800 miles away. How do we build that city? And then everybody's ears prick up and they're like, That's the, I want to work for that company. Yeah. I want to work for that city. Yeah. And it's yeah. the same flipping city. All I've done is ask a simple question. I've, yeah. I've Reframing moved. it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I, I love that. I love that. And I'm, I'm a big, big passion this because I, I love customer experience and it was my whole bag, you know, and still to this day now, I'm still working on this kind of idea of how do we create this magical customer experience and we create this um, focus. I'm just going to give you an example here of something where it's gone wrong. And uh, this, this is quite recently. So over the, the winter period, I had to go and um, stock shelves because firstly for my insanity really just because mental health it's like what, what the hell am i doing you know i remember stocking shelves and i remember the first impression of walking into that store now as an agency colleague because i needed the flexibility to do my job when it happened and i remember walking in and the first person said to me are you agency <laughs> no i'm uh, i'm ricky lock i'm a human hello <laughs> you know and that just set the tone of that culture immediately now, um, there was one guy who uh, actually was one of my grooms um, that um, I actually performed magic for, which was very strange when, you know, you consider yourself as this performer and then two or three years later you turn up and then he's the boss. It's like a complete role reversal. Yeah, can, you stack these, can you stack these shelves by magic, Ricky? Come on. Yeah, it's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, um, but I, I loved that what he was trying to create. You could tell there was a different culture when he was on shift completely. Yeah. He would walk around, he'd check in. How are you doing? You all right? How's things? He'd know your name. He'd come say hello to you. Agency colleague. Um, my induction was like, yeah, just, just pair up with that other agency colleague. He'll tell you what to do. All oh, right. Okay, cool. Didn't want to go back because no. just didn't feel part of it. Well, well, you know, I was just a number. I was a cheap colleague on an agency thing. And that was not the culture for me. Um, but anyway, look, let's talk about this. Um, as I go through kind of near the end of this, I want to ask some couple of questions to you. So I think the biggest thing for me is this year, I'm trying to unravel this idea of, what makes people create these magical experiences? So how can we, Benjamin, create a customer-focused culture? What do we do to create that? Um, you need to give people permission and freedom because you cannot legislate for every situation. And the situations that create the magic are the ones that usually happen because something has gone wrong. Yeah. You know, actually, we, we often get more kudos for solving a problem well than we do for, like, I'll give you an example. The other day, and people still order the, the lace mutts from my website, so we get a few orders a month, still sending them out. The other day, I found um, an order online that hadn't been marked off as sent, and it was a couple of weeks old. So I refunded the order, and I sent out four instead of one. And the four turned up, and I got an email from the lady saying, um, I've just received four, and I've just had a refund but you actually sent me the original one. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm, you know, we forgot to mark it off. And yeah. that's not acceptable that you did not get your order. Even though you did, we hadn't marked it off as got. So in my opinion, you hadn't got it. So you get, I sent you more than you needed and I refunded your order because that's not okay. Yeah. And actually the, the, she's passed them on to lots of people and is talking about us, yeah. even though we made the mistake because of the way we reacted to the mistake. But yeah. actually it's all about having the freedom to go, what are the values? The values is every customer goes, whoa, instead of, oh, you know, we're moving customers from, oh, yeah. to whoa. Yeah, if that's yeah. a value, you give people the permission to do it. I, yeah. I, the Ritz hotels, you, you probably know this story. If you, 
every single person who works there can spend $2,000 per guest stay to solve problems. Don't have to ask, don't have to go through management, don't have to get it signed off by four people in the, in the boardroom. They can spend it. Yes, they look at all that afterwards and go, what are we spending this money on? Are there any of these problems we can solve? Is there anything that we need to put into training to, so we don't have to keep spending this money? Yeah. But in the moment, we trust our people to get it right. So you, you've got to trust people to make those decisions. You cannot, you cannot control them and give them scripts and say, it's not my job. I need to put... let them solve yeah. problems. And the, under, the underpinning of that is we have to have an organization that is built on trust. I've got to hire the right people that I can trust to make those right decisions, to not take the mick, to not give their mates lots of freebies because they've got that ability. <laughs> yeah. You've got, and, and that comes down to hiring the right people, but also giving them a reason. A building, what's your business for? What does it do? You know, actually, I've, I spoke about the drivers. Actually, we drive. Well, I, can't, I don't really give a damn. So you probably can't trust me to, to do it well because you haven't really inspired me. Whereas actually, we are the nerve center of Britain. We are serving this country and keeping this country going. Yeah. I'm excited about that. I want to do it well. I want to do it right. I want to serve. Yeah. It's a, so actually, you've got to give them a reason and you've got to hire the right people. And then you've got to trust them to do their job. Mm. Stop trying to control them. It's a big part of service. You know, the Love whole that. thing about, um, you know, I phone up and I've got a problem with a broken thing. Oh, you've opened it. It's out of the packet. It's nothing I can do. It's policy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. I'm here. I'm a customer. I've spent 700 pounds this year with you. I've got <laughs> a 15 pound piece of kit that, that I think is broken and I've come back. Yeah. And I'm Premier in. I could go, I could go on and say, oh, Premier in. You know, they're, they're good night guarantee. I phoned up one evening and I couldn't sleep because my father was snoring. <laughs> they refunded the room because I didn't sleep. It was a guarantee. Amazing. Yeah. And, you know, don't get me yeah. wrong. I've spent thousands of pounds with Premier in over the last few years. So for them, you know, 100 quid was neither here nor there. Yeah. Yeah. But the fact they didn't quibble, they asked me a few questions. They asked the hotel, they asked whether I spoke to the reception. Well, you know, but they said, that's fine, we've refunded it. Yeah, uh, we could be all down this idea of process. I hate it because it's just this idea. Why did we forget what's the right thing to do for our customer? You know, why do we have to say this? Process is great because it helps our people streamline, makes things efficient. But you have to let your people step out of process if there is a good reason to do it. Yes. Serve a customer. You know, yeah, yeah. you see it all the time, don't you? The 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 um any kind of mobile phone company all over the billboards, how much they love their customers and how much we want you as a customer until you phone them up. And then yeah. you've got 14 menus and a robot before you can get to anybody <laughs> that can actually solve your problem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I remember back in the days, back in um in Argos in some of my stores, I remember walking into one store one day as a store manager. And uh, back in the day in Argos, if you had like a, a refund of an item over £65, you'd be at the till. And I would say, I've got to go ask my manager for authorization of that. And then they'd walk off, leave the customer stand there going, what? <laughs> and then they go up to their manager to ask them. And then they come back and they're either going to say, yeah, my manager said, yes, that's fine. And it's like, whoa, 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 just exactly what you said. When do we start, you know, we recruit people to do a job, but actually you can do a job so much, but I don't want you to do everything. Like you just lose that trust. Yeah. And we immediately said, no, don't, don't even come up to me. Just make a decision. What yeah. do you think you should do? You know? And yeah, we then start to create that culture where we start to kind of go the extra mile. And, and that's what it's all about, isn't it? You know, when did we get stuck on process? I've seen this in myself in the last 12 months with wedding supplies. Hey, we're, uh, we're moving our date because COVID. Right, we're not getting your deposit back. Whoa, well, hang on a minute. What's what? Yeah, okay, there's a contract there, there's a process there. But wait, hang on a minute. This person cannot get married. You can't do your job. Yeah, but the contract says I'm not doing it, so I'm not giving it back. Well, go do it. See what happens to your business because you won't be around much longer. You know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And people are voting people are voting with their feet. And this is why we need businesses that actually have a purpose. In that situation, you go, I'm really sorry. At the yeah. moment, because of what's going on, we're gonna be we are unable to refund it immediately. How yeah. about we move the date and we just use it as a deposit for the new date? Would that suffice? Yeah. You know, 99% of people will be okay with that. And then you get one that you would actually have to find the cash to refund. Yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. Work. Yeah. I, I had loads of couples in the last 12 months where their wedding and um, they, they moved for me like two or three times. And then by the third time I couldn't do the date. So deposit went back and I even sent them their, uh, like a, a goodbye package. That was money out of my business gone. Yeah but it's how I make them feel. 
because yeah. at the end of the day, this is who I am. This is my culture. This is what I do. I create these wow moments. I am creating magic for people. And if I'm not doing that, then I'm not me. Yeah. And, and that's what say, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Send them a card to say, I'm sorry, I couldn't do your wedding, but I like yeah. you so much. If you have another event or a garden party, let me know. Cause I'd love to come yeah. to that as well. Exactly. Exactly. Well, um, Ben, so a couple of things. Then. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions before we, um, my speaker's just connected there. Can you still hear me, Ben? I can still hear you. There yeah. we go. So a couple of questions here then. So for I, I do get a lot of listeners on this podcast that are small business owners, solopreneurs. They're probably going to think, well, I don't have a culture. I just sit in my office or in my shed. But what advice would you say for anyone, even if it's just an individual or a solopreneur, about creating a culture? What can they do right now to start creating this culture and then start driving that behavior to create this great experience? Absolutely. I, and it, even one person shows need to be really clear on why are you doing what you're doing? What are you trying to build? And what are your values? Because that will help you define who you're going to, who your suppliers are, what sort yeah. of customers you want to say yes and no to. And we do say no to customers that we like, no, because it's going to be a bloody nightmare. Yeah. You'll know that you'll start to your marketing messaging and everything you put out there will start to have the same themes and feel like you want it to feel because it comes from a place of values. When you truly understand that, you distinguish yourself from your competition, clearly. When you get your values right, and I can't take them and attach them to your competition and they don't look out of place, you start to stand out. And let me tell you, your culture is your only truly competitive advantage. It's the only thing your, your competitors can't steal. I guarantee you, as a solo entrepreneur, somebody will steal your idea. They'll steal your product and they'll... Nothing you can do about it unless you've got two million pounds in the bank to take them to court. There's nothing all you can do about it. You can send yeah. them a cease and desist, but if they ignore it, what are you going to do? Nothing. They cannot steal your culture because when they try to implement it, they just look like fools. So you have to, yeah. even as a solo entrepreneur, you've got to get this right and it will drive everything else in your business in a way that feels authentic. Everything will start to become easier. Your marketing messaging, it'll all just start to flow when you nail this. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's 100%. So I think we just need to stop. Just look at what is important to us then, where are we actually going? Why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you getting out of bed to do this job? And then start driving forward. Yeah. yeah. You know what, Benjamin? I had this conversation recently about I've got a course that's a it's soft launch. It's coming out pretty much soon. And someone said to me, Ricky, why are you teaching people what you do? Because I said, because they won't do it the way I do it. I can teach people to do what I do, but they're not me. And 80% of people don't do anything anyway when they learn courses, but they'll go off and do it. But I can teach them, but they're not going to be me. That's not my culture. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I've, gone, yeah. um, I've got, I work with clients and I produce something called a culture playbook, which essentially says these are our values. Yeah. And therefore, this is how we behave on a day to day basis. This is what's important in the attitude we bring to work. This is how we treat each other. This is what we say to clients, all that kind of thing, but not, not prescriptive, but just the kind of the atmosphere around those kind of things. Yeah. And sometimes I'll, you know, clients will look at it and go, oh, I'm not going to write my own playbook. And it just does not hit home. They know yeah. what to do and they can go through that process, but there's something emotive about the language and the way it's written and the way you turn the pages. And it takes you on this emotional journey through what it's like to be part of this organization. But they just can't repeat. So I could, I could give all that away. People still wouldn't be able to replicate it. Yeah, absolutely. Benjamin, thank you so much. I've enjoyed the conversation. I've got three questions I'm going to ask you. A top tip for people on how to be the best version of themselves. What would you say? Know the good you are putting out into the world. What is it that, why is the world a better place? Because your organization exists. That is a key question. When you, when you nail that, everything becomes so much easier. Everything, you, you, you start to become the best in your field. Love that. And Ben, a personal question for you. How are you creating magic in the world? That's a, a great one. I've just kicked off a challenge, actually. And this is this, uh, this has kind of grown over the last six months in my thinking, but I've only finally kind of landed it. Um, and it's called the, the Legacy Impact Challenge. And it gathers people um, uh, on a challenge over 20 minutes over five, each day over five days to look at exactly that question. What it is good that you're putting out into the world? What, and then it moves on to kind of, well, actually, how are we trying to solve the problem that you're trying to solve? Let's build an MVP. Let's actually build that into your business. It's out the back of it, it starts to create products that solve those problems and actually does good in the world. And so that's how I'm launching. I've launched that over August and we're kicking off in September. So 
really excited about that. So we can Brilliant. gather lots of other people and you know exponentially multiply the people that are changing the world, that are doing good in business. So we, we can put a link then in the show notes for that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. Perfect. Brilliant. And um, before I... Uh, I get everyone to find out where you are and follow because because Benjamin has a fantastic branding as well. Like uh, you'll see it on the video for any listeners on this podcast. If you're watching it on the YouTube, you'll see he has an amazing, cool little branding with the glasses and the red and the yellow. Uh, but he also has an amazing book as well called Culture, surprisingly. Um, but Ben, talk about this book and uh, also where can people find you if they want to find out more? Um, the book was published a couple of years ago, but it takes you through the process. My one framework which is all about that defining that one purpose, finding your one team that can help you deliver it, understanding your one voice so everything is authentic and is the same, and building your one systems. So actually everything points and drives. It's that sticker rock, making sure that everything yeah. flows through your business. That's in the book, and the book takes you through that process, and you can write in the book. And if you can yes. read, you can buy the book and do it for free. You don't need to hire me. <laughs> Yeah, and it's a really great book. It's really simple. It's got lots of space that you can, as Ben can see here, look, I've got corners folded over. Um, there you go, Ben. Have you see. written in it? Yeah. Have you written in it? I, I did actually, it. yeah. Good. I'll show you. Um, ta -da! Yeah, good. Yeah. That's what it's for. Um, love it. Yeah, it's an absolutely fantastic book and filled with really great stories and great quotes as well. So, yeah, love it. So, Benjamin, thanks for coming on the show. If people want to find out more about you, where can they find out from you? They can go to thecultureguide.co.uk. Well, get onto Google and search for The Culture Guy. I will uh, pop up first. Love it. Benjamin, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for coming on the show. Ricky, always amazing chatting to you. Thank you for having me. Thanks a lot, mate.